self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Very warm welcome to all of you in this uh, evening at the Bali. Um, yeah, that's the good thing. If you're the last one, it's only in the front we have seats left. <laughs> um, welcome at this evening. My name is uh, Esther van Rijswijk and we are here together because of the Dutch translation, translation of David Greber's book about bullshit jobs. Um, it may be a bit of a scary night. How many of you have read the book? Quite a few, I would say, for those looking at, uh, uh, listening at home. Probably about 15%. Um, this night will be streamed, so um, uh, whenever you want to say something, please wait for the mic. And we're going to be uh, talking to and with you a lot, we hope. So before I introduce David, um, I want you all um, to take your telephone, uh, because we're going to use that. Normally I say switch off your telephone, do switch it off. But now I also want you to take it, because um, we want to get to know you a little bit. Um, so Dana, if we can switch to Mentimeter. Um, it's very easy um, because you're going you're gonna to be using your phone as well to, to put questions forward. But first I want to introduce you to the tool a little bit. So please go to menti.com. You can just use the browser because it doesn't use a lot of data or anything. Just do it on your 4G or otherwise take the Wi-Fi from the cafe, which is an open Wi-Fi. Uh, and then if you put forward the code 642367, um, and then maybe you uh, want to answer this question. I am. <laughs> what comes up? What are you? Who are you? Or whatever. Ah, happy. We have happy people in the room. That's good. I hope you're going to stay happy because I can tell you, I was a bit scared when I started reading the book because I was so afraid I was going to find out I had a bullshit job, actually. And maybe some of you will find out tonight that when you really think about it, you do have a bullshit job. I don't know if that's bad. I find out I'm not, I can't have a bullshit job because I'm not employed. So I was very happy. I'm self-employed. I think you have to define other ways because still I can be totally useless, of course. But um, good, so you're all curious. You're tired, of course. Intrigued, skeptical. Hungry? Oh my God, a vegan. We have a vegan. Where's the vegan in the house? The vegan in the house is Kadir. There's three vegans in the house. Good. We have makers. We have somebody. We have energetic. We have young and lazy. We have everything. That's good. Uh, let me put forward. I'm, I'm going to put you into this uh, funnel a little bit and uh, uh, go to the next question. Um, if you want to switch. Yeah. Now here you have to really choose. Now you can't decide for yourself. You are what? Are you employed, self-employed like me? Then you can't have a bullshit job, which is good. Or a student. Ah, there's many employed people. So those are going to find out today if they didn't know already if they have a bl bullshit job. Good. Okay. That's a clear. We have about, how many people are there here, Merlijn? 160, okay, and 106 logged in. You can still do it up in the front and you can do it whenever you want. So this tool um, we're gonna be using and you can also use it to put questions forward. You see a little in the middle of your screen, you see this little uh, square and where it says question. You can put a question forward there. Um, it's a very good tool because people sometimes like to like make a speech 
which makes my job more difficult. But here you have to do it like in maybe 200 uh, signs or whatever. And the good thing is, if you have a really a good question, you can vote for each other's questions. Uh, so if there's a question with you, with the audience, and everybody says this really needs an answer, do vote for each other's questions, and we will definitely put them forward to uh, David. Uh, I've reserved the last part of the evening for that. I, I really want to take time for that, so 20, 25 minutes. Um, but if really urgent stuff comes up, and I, I will be chatting here with him, and if you guys get bored, put the questions for me, and Merlin will drag me out of it and say, Esther, yes, this is a total wrong interview. The people here want to know different things. So then we'll just switch to you, I promise. Um, good. David, um, I want to go to the next one, Merlin. Uh, so... What comes to mind when we say David Graeber? Maybe you don't know him, maybe you do. <laughs> what is he to you? <laughs> Bullshit, yeah. Philosophy. Maagdenhuis, some people may have seen him in the Maagdenhuis where he was a couple of years ago. Sociologist, bold statements. No clue, says somebody. Twitter. Uh, he's the guy sitting next to me. Oh, hello. Well, good. Uh, he's a genius, somebody says. Now, if you want to say, yeah, I too think he's a genius, then write it down and it gets bigger and we get a proper word cloud about who David really is, or at least who we think he is, because we will get to know him better tonight. Occupy. He was, he's seen as one of the heroes of Occupy. He's an anthropologist. He's holistic, an original thinker. I think it's time we get uh, David here to see if this is all a good picture of David. Can I have a big round of applause, please, for David Graeber? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So what do you th see, think when you see this? Well, I'm kind of shocked and disturbed. <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess. What would you, what you put in the middle? What would be your main thing? I don't know. I don't know. I'll leave it to others to decide who I am. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I think so, too. That's yeah. probably the best way to go. Um, well, Occupy Hero, it's in here. Uh, you are a professor of anthropology, I of am, course, yes. at the London School of Economics. You've written a couple of books. That's that. Eh? Yeah, That's yeah, what a lot of that. people... I guess everybody knows that one. Yeah. yeah. So there was a book on the history of that. Or five, Death, five... the first 5,000 years was the title in English. Right? Yeah. And after you've read it, then what do you know? Um, For those who didn't? The very short version? It's 566 <laughs> pages. Um, you, you know that, that debt existed before money, that, that everything they tell you about the history of economics is probably wrong. Good. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's all read it, then yeah. we know why the history of economics is all wrong. Um, You've also been called a professor of uh, resistance and revolution. Why is that? <laughs> well, I don't know, considering I don't teach it at all. Um, actually, I'm a very conventional anthropologist in a lot of ways. Uh, I have been in, I kind of have a two-track career in that way, because I, ha I write stuff for activist audiences as well, but not um, for academic ones uh, in academic venues. I kind of mix it up a little bit. I, back in 2000, I got involved in the global justice movement, and I've been kind of doing that kind of thing ever since. And then for some, that immediately makes you a revolutionary. Yeah, my <laughs> people, my, my employers at the time were not happy at all, but that's why I'm no longer in America. I kind of got kicked out of the American Academy. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Are you sad about that? Well, I mean, you know, you got to be a little sad being kicked out of your country, but I like where I am now. I'm kicked very happy. Kicked out of the country, even. Yeah, yeah if well, you're basically I mean, as a scientist. Well, I mean, for seven years, I, every place I applied for a job, like I was just nixed immediately, yeah. Oh. In America, everywhere else in the world, everybody wanted to hire me. And then me, you came so to really Europe. Weird, yeah. But you didn't go far enough, and you ended up in Britain. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We will. <laughs> we can always have you. Okay. First, we're going to give you the floor for about 10, 12 minutes. You're going to give us, I don't know, the introduction to the book. Yeah. And I'll... we're going to have an interview and uh, see what happens. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another round of applause, please, for Dave. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess what I should talk about is, is how I came to write the book, because it's kind of an interesting story. I'm an anthropologist by profession, and I've always felt that I'm an anthropologist in two ways. The whole idea of anthropology is that a clueless outsider sometimes can see things that people who really know what's going on can't. That, you know, if, if you're 
there's got to be some reason that someone who actually doesn't come from a place, you know, just shows up, will have some insights that, that people who've lived there all their lives won't have. Um, I always think it's a little like learning a foreign language, right? You know, where you, you, you notice connections between words that native speakers never notice. Uh, and in a similar way, uh, I was, I'm an anthropologist by profession, in my field work in Madagascar, but I also always felt I'm a little bit of an anthropologist or an outsider in the world of academia itself. I don't come from that kind of background. And, you know, I've always felt there's something a little odd that I don't really understand and I'm trying to figure out the rules. And, and this is even more true of the sort of professional managerial back classes of people that kind of circulate around academia. You kind of meet them in parties, often they're married to academics. And um, I kept having this experience where I would meet people and I'd say, oh, so I'm an anthropologist, what do you do? And they'd say, oh, nothing really. And, you know, I thought they were just being modest, right? Um, so, you know, you press them a little bit, you get a few drinks later. They admit that actually, no, they, they meant it literally. They literally do nothing all day. You kept meeting these people who'd say, yeah, I just basically do cat memes all day or update my Facebook profile. I don't tell my boss, but really, I mean, you could do my job in an hour, two hours a week, you know? Um, so that was my first inkling. So I started asking people, well, what do you really do in these people with office jobs? And so more and more of them either said they really didn't do anything at all, or they, what they did was totally pointless, or they felt it could be easily automated, um, or sometimes they felt their entire industry shouldn't exist. I mean, I met a lot of people like that. They'd say, well, you know, I'm a corporate lawyer. It's all bullshit. Yeah. Um, I'm a telemarketer. It shouldn't, you know, horrible industry shouldn't exist. Um, so, so I began to wonder how common is this. And around that time, I had a friend who was starting up a new magazine. It was a kind of anarcho-feminist magazine called Strike. And my friend said, you know, why don't you publish something in our our new issue? Uh, just anything you want. Do you have anything lying around that no one else would ever publish? I thought. Yeah, I got some stuff like that. Um, so, I said, okay, what drunken party rant would no one ever possibly publish? I know. I'll write something about the bullshit job phenomena. So I, I put this piece together. It was almost like a joke. I said, you know, 100 years ago, John Maynard Keynes said that by now we'd all be working a 15-hour week. Automation will have replaced most of our jobs. And... We'd be living lives of luxury and leisure. And, and, and if you look at the jobs that actually existed in the 1930s, well, mostly they are automated away. I mean, most of them no longer exist. In fact, um, we could be working 15-hour weeks. But instead, if you look at what's happened, you've had this huge increase in these administrative, clerical, managerial, and supervisory jobs. Basically, just the jobs where people say that it's really bullshit, they're not really doing anything. So I said, well, maybe it's almost as if there was some evil genius out there making up jobs that, just to keep us working. We've all got this idea that everybody should be working all the time because it's wrong that people should get something for nothing. So, so it's better for us to sort of sit there and pretend to work all day uh, than, than to just sort of sit back or um, live lives of ease and luxury. Uh, so, and. I wrote it, as I say, almost as a joke, but actually it's a funny story. I, 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 my girlfriend at the time decided we needed to get away from the world, so we went off to this cabin in the countryside with a basket of books. We went to a place with no wireless. I just had my phone, and that was the week that this article came out, and I was just sort of staring slack-jawed at my phone. It's like, oh my God, this thing, it went immediately viral all over the world. Um, within two weeks, it had been translated in, I think, 13 different languages. It's up to 24 by now, actually. Um, it, the, the server kept crashing. It got reproduced in newspapers all over the world. People started um, writing these confessions on, on, on the comment section. It was saying things like, 
oh my God, it's true. I'm a corporate lawyer. I contribute nothing to society. <laughs> I, I'm miserable all the time. No one knows my secret pain. You know? <laughs> and, um, and there's more and more of this. And people start saying, oh, you think that's a bullshit job. You know, let me tell you about my job. And <laughs> it just became this, this, this strange global phenomena. I got people sending me notes saying, hi, I work in the financial services industry. I've got this article across my desk 20 times just today. You know, I've been distributing. We formed a team. And I was like, wow, you guys really aren't doing much. Well, are you? <laughs> I thought you guys were busy all the time in finance. Anyway, so, so, so it went crazy. And gradually, one thing led to another. I mean, I thought at this point, Wow, this is much, much worse than I thought. So I thought maybe 20%, 25% of jobs would fit this category. Jobs, and I define bullshit jobs as jobs which even the person doing it secretly believes shouldn't exist. Um, either because, you know, if that job were to disappear, they feel that either it would make no difference whatsoever, or the world might be a slightly better place. So, you know, what does that do to you every day, walking into a job where you secretly believe the job shouldn't be there? What does that do to your sense of yourself? And I mean, maybe people really are miserable, and this is something we can't talk about. And apparently it was, it was true, but um, I didn't realize quite how common it was. At this point, I say maybe 15, 20% of jobs seem to be this way. But eventually, one thing led to another, and somebody did an actual survey. It was YouGov. And then later, apparently, someone did one here in Holland. And they came up with basically identical results. In, in the UK, 37% of all employees said their job makes no meaningful contribution to the world. And, and here in the Netherlands, it was actually higher. It was uh, 40%. And those are people who are sure. You know, there's also the people who, you know, maybe I'm, I don't know. So only, only 50, only half of all workers actually knew for sure that their job made any difference at all. I thought that was amazing. Um, so what I did was I started advertising on Twitter. I have a lot of followers on Twitter. So I said, all right, tell me about your most pointless job. Have you ever had a job that was just completely useless? I want to know all about it. You know, since I, I made up an email account, uh, do I have a BS job or what at gmail.com? You can still send things to it if you like. Because, you know, I mean, you're not allowed to use the word bullshit in a Gmail title. Um, but um, I got about 300 uh, different narratives, testimonies of people who had bullshit jobs. And using that, I kind of began to put together a little sociological typology of, of what kind of bullshit jobs they are and how they happen. So maybe I'll end with that. Um, I ended up by distinguishing between five major types based on the things that people sent in. And I should emphasize that these are overwhelmingly office jobs. I mean, there are people with kind of working class bullshit jobs. There's you know, museum guards who guard rooms with nothing in it. That was one guy who wrote to me. Um, you know, there's things like that, yeah, and they're really horrible. But, but for the most part, these jobs are actually really good jobs. Um, they're paid pretty well. They have good benefits. You get treated with respect, you know. Um, often people would say that that was what made it so bizarre that, you know, if I have a job where you're actually doing something useful, I used to be a gardener, I used to be a preschool teacher. They didn't pay me, so I had to get a job working in an office doing nothing. But then they gave me lots of money, and everybody treated me like I was a success. And you know, people were really confused what to make of that. Because this is actually one of the things that, that emerged from my uh, research, is that there seems to be a general rule that the more your work actually and obviously benefits other human beings, the less that they're going to pay you to do it. So, so the more useless or even you know, harmful your job, the more you get paid, and the more respect and, 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 and social status you get from having it. So you know, there's nothing more useful than a garbage collector, but you don't get you know, treated that well. Um, and so, so people would have the situation where, you know, here I am, I, I, my family considers me to be 
the member of my family who's been most successful, I put on a suit, I go to work every day, you know, but secretly I know that I work in a firm with three times as many managers as workers, and you know, we're all just sitting there staring at each other and doing, you know, um, what, what, do I, how, what do I make of this? Do I tell other people? Do I tell my coworkers? Does my supervisor know that I'm actually not doing anything? You know, the, the, it, it, people are really haunted by this phenomena. And, and, and they, the fact that they were treated with such respect and paid so much actually made it worse, you know? So, so people had feelings of guilt, anxiety, depression. Uh, they started treating each other very badly in workplaces. A lot of people would say that the more pointless the job, the more people scream at each other and mistreat each other and bully each other. So, all right. Um, so these are office jobs. They're well respected, but they're pointless. And they seem to be a huge increasing sector of the economy. Um, I came up with a typology of five different types. And I'll, uh, as I say, I'll end with that. Um, I would distinguish between um, what I call flunkies, goons, duct tapers, box tickers, and taskmasters. I'll, I'll go through them one by one, and then we can do the interview part. Um, a flunky, that's kind of obvious, a flunky is a person who's basically just there to make someone else look or feel good about themselves. There's a lot of these jobs. In fact, often corporate managers, executives, their status is measured by how many people they have working under them. So they have no incentive to fire anybody who's unnecessary. So they sort of accumulate these sort of useless people that, that are, they're almost like feudal retainers. You know, they sort of sit around making you look impressive. And, and so there's a lot of those kind of jobs. Um, and well, for example, uh, there's a lot of companies that have like two or three receptionists, even though there's only, they only get one call a day. <laughs> They're just there because they want to have someone making them look impressive. So there's millions of jobs like that. Um, the second type are goons. Goons are a little weird because I hadn't necessarily thought that they were bullshit jobs myself. But so many people wrote to me and described themselves as having a bullshit job. People who are telemarketers, people who are corporate lawyers, people who worked in PR. Uh, public relations, merchandising, marketing, those people often said, well, you know, I'm useful to the company, but I'm only useful to the company because our competitors also employ someone like me. You don't need a telemarketer. The only reason you might need a telemarketer is because if you're competitor as a telemarketer. So that's a little like, you know, if the first one is a little like feudal retainers, the second one is a little like feudal lords. Right? Because a feudal lord, you know, in theory, their job is to protect the peasants. But who are they protecting the peasants from? Other feudal lords, right? So if there are no feudal lords, you don't need a feudal lord. Um, so similarly, if there are no corporate lawyers, you don't need a corporate lawyer. If there are no telemarketers, you don't need a telemarketer, and so forth. So, so people would say, well, my job is useful, but the entire industry is bullshit. OK, so that's a goon. Um, then you have duct tapers. I'll speed up through the last ones. A duct taper is basically someone who is there to solve a problem that shouldn't exist. Um, a great example of this I, I ran into when I was at uh, my first university I was at in England. Uh, there was one point when I needed a carpenter. The shelves collapsed in my office. There was a big hole in the wall, uh, books everywhere. And um, I tried to get the carpenter, and the office like ended up calling the carpenter every day, uh, calling buildings and grounds. I ended up calling. For two weeks, we spent trying to get the carpenter. And we realized there was one guy, and his entire job was to apologize for the fact that the carpenter didn't come. <laughs> he was a very nice man. You know, he was good at his job. You really felt bad about, you know, sorry to bother you. I mean, <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, you know, he, he, but you can't imagine he was very happy doing that for a living. And, you know, there was this, always this voice going through my head saying, can't they just fire that guy and hire another carpenter? <laughs> you know, if they had two carpenters, they wouldn't need him, right? Um, 
so, so that's a classic example of a duct taper. Yeah. It's as if you have a hole in the ceiling and instead of fixing it, you put a bucket there and you hire some guy to empty the bucket every hour, right? Okay, so there's a lot of jobs like that. Um, box tickers are people who basically are there that are, so that an organization, a company, a government, whatever it might be, uh, an organization can say that they're doing something that they're not actually doing. Uh, so there are people in government, they're the people who write in commissions of inquiry. If there's a problem, you pretend you're investigating. Um, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of businesses, like it's all about filling out forms saying you've done something. There's whole industries like um, uh, compliance. Compliance in banks, you know, there was all, oh, or corporations have to have legions of people to make them pretend that they're following regulations or not following. So that's one whole industry. And then finally, there's taskmasters. And taskmasters are there to um, essentially either A, supervise people who don't need supervision, and there's a lot of that, like most middle managers, actually. I mean, they wrote to me. People would say, I'm a middle manager. It's a bullshit job. I mean, I used to do this job. I know they don't need some middle manager to tell them what to do. Um, or alternately, um, to make up bullshit for other people to do. And um, that's actually what middle managers will eventually do if they figure out that you know just sitting there is boring, people don't need supervision, so you assign them pointless tasks, you make up box picking rituals for them to do. So, so those are the five basic types. Um, and and the, the big question is why these have multiplied over the years, but perhaps we'll get to that soon. Yeah, let's take <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. We will definitely get to that. Take a seat. So, um, take a seat. Have some water. Okay. And I'll uh, I'll go. Maybe already go into the audience a bit because there's there's not a lot of voting going on, but there is a leading question, and it's immediately we're getting a bit scientific. I think. Um, who post, posted the question? How do you prevent election bias since people with bullshit jobs are more likely to respond to a questionnaire? All the way in the back, I'll come, because this is how I'm going to thank you guys for posing a question. Um, so, is, are you saying, oh, I can't get there. <laughs> yeah, now I was going to ask you if you're a scientist and is the, the rationale behind it, if you can, uh, Dana, if you can put it on the screen, if you go to Mentimeter, then I will uh, put it for, is there a rationale behind it, is it, um, Maybe that you say because they have bullshit jobs, they probably don't have anything to do, and they're filling in the questionnaire? <laughs> okay, that's the question. David. That's an interesting... I, I'm not a pollster. I assume that they thought of that. I assume, you know, basic stuff like that, but... I'm sorry. It was a professional poll a polling organization that did the survey. It wasn't me. No, I understand. Uh. I'm sorry, but the people at home can't hear you if, if you if you go into a debate mm. from there. So either tell me and I'll tell him. So what's your question? Yeah, if you come up with figures. Okay, is it scientific? Yeah, is the they're research scientific. you did yeah. scientific? Okay. Yeah, the, um, of the, course. He's it scientist. was YouGov <laughs> in England, and I don't remember the name of the polling agency, but these are the people who do political surveys, who do all the, you know, they're the standard scientific survey people. No, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop you because nobody can hear you, and also we want to move on to the next one. Uh -huh. um, I'm, there's a, the, the, the voting has mm. gone up, that's why I sh put the, f the wrong one in front first. Mm. But let me, this one now has seven votes. Is there a correlation between the prevalence of be bullshit jobs per country and the rate of depression? Seems to be that some people think, well, maybe it's yeah. depression that, uh, that we're measuring. Um, well, it's very interesting because a lot of people who had these jobs were very depressed. And often they couldn't quite figure out why. You know, part of the reason, uh, part of the experience is, you know, you're saying, well, I'm getting something for nothing. Why am I so sad? You know, uh, and, and I think that has to do a very deep misunderstanding about human nature. You know, we have this idea that people are economics teaches us that there were these kind of we are these rational engines of maximization 
we, we all want to put out the least effort and get the most reward. Uh, but in fact, these are people who basically are asked to put out almost no effort in many cases and get all sorts of rewards. And, and they're very, very unhappy. And I think it shows us that people are, are not really the way we are taught to imagine that they are. But, but it causes people to be very depressed. And if you think about it, what is depression? I mean, a lot of it has to do with a sense of pointlessness. You know, nothing has any meaning. There's no real reason to do anything. There's, um, and it's almost as if these jobs are objectively trying to create the experience of depression by making depression objectively true, at least during the time that you're at work. Um, so I think it's true. I mean, there are statistics. But, yeah. yeah, that was going to be my question. Do yeah. you know if it's true or do you think it's true? No, I know that there are statistics that have shown that rates of depression go up in societies, in consumer societies. Okay, but we yeah. don't know if those people who say, I have a bullshit job, No, are but also the societies depressed. which... The societies yeah. which are consumer societies do seem to be the ones which have a higher rate of bullshit jobs. Okay. But no one's actually looked directly at that. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, go and see if you guys think you have a bullshit job. Uh, Marlene, if you can close this question and go to the next one. Um, uh, um, maybe but we have really the... At the, yeah, you, you are very eager. Okay, good, sure. Let's I don't do it the old fight fashioned with you. way. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for the mic, please, because otherwise the people ca at home can't hear it because we're being streamed. Professor Kreber, it's a little bit a nasty question, but it, it stinks in my mind, so I have to ask it. To Can you. we hear it? Okay. Is okay. it on? So you, you talk about bullshit jobs, but you, you mentioned five categories. But what about the world of academia, where you come from? <laughs> There are lots of people there who produce papers, they have to produce, they have to publish or perish. They get all the time yeah. free How money many from of government. Your colleagues? Actually, this whole world may be 70% bullshit. <laughs> and the world of the free enterprise, you mentioned already in your book, has many shareholders, they're very critical. They say, oh, we cannot have two people at the I office. I explained in the beginning that you are the reason we're using the tool. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. So how okay. many of your colleagues are... Well, you have uh, to ask them. I mean, the entire... But you did, didn't yeah. you? Uh, the entire criteria that I use is, is that, you know, if you have a bullshit job, you know it. The best, the best, only method to use is to ask people. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. basically what you're saying. You're saying, yes. I'm not deciding yeah. who has, but we're asking to be. Right. There would be nothing more obnoxious here. than me going out saying, you, your job is bullshit. <laughs> you, you're okay. No, I do not claim to know whose job is worthwhile. What I'm interested in is people who feel their own jobs aren't worthwhile and why. My impression is there are some academics who feel that way about themselves, uh, but not that many because teaching is... I mean, if nothing else, even if you feel your research is bullshit, people usually do not feel that teaching is a pointless exercise. Um, you know, you see your students learn things and understand things that they didn't understand before. Okay. In a way, it's the best, the least bullshit labor you can possibly do. In the meantime, the audience has been answering this question. Oh, yeah. I've had a bullshit job. It's kind of what you were It's pretty expecting. much it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's quite a lot. You also right. warned me that if we ask them if they've had one once, they will admit but if we go to the next question. Do you have one now? Obviously, no one's going to say, yes, yes, I have. I mean, we've all had, <laughs> I've had bullshit boyfriends. Well, now, well, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure. Can you be aware at the right moment that you have a bullshit job or a bullshit boyfriend or a bullshit? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think that, in, whoa. What's just turned around? How did it go down? Yeah. But how did it go from... So we probably don't know. Isn't it like... Oh, oh, have one now. Yes. Well, there, exactly. So everybody had them in the past, but no one has one now, right? <laughs> so is it kind of the same as having a bullshit boyfriend without knowing it? No, because, because, I mean, it's possible to have one and not know it. And this is something which is actually interesting, because people will often say, oh, you're just asking people, that doesn't make any sense, because, you know, how, a lot of people might not understand how their work really contributes to the company. And, you know, yes, in theory, that is true. But if you're working for 10, 20 years at a job, and it seems like it's pointless, but actually there's some way that it's really important, 
what's the chance no one's ever going to tell you that, you know? On the other hand, look at it the other way. Imagine you're sitting there gathering data which is going to be used for a report that actually no one ever reads. Well, that, no one's going to tell you that they don't read it. Yeah. And that's the very thing they won't tell you. So it's much more likely that a lot, you know, you're going to get people under-reporting the real numbers if you just ask them. Do, we think, do you think we have to celebrate those 15 people who said yes? <laughs> I think they are very brave. You know? Do you think we get them to stand up? No, that's no? really mean. <laughs> Don't do that. No, but we can tell them that we're that they're so. No, okay. No. Anybody wants to talk? You want to get it? people fired? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why don't you put the camera on? Too? Somebody <laughs> wants to talk, but I think we have one okay. person there who says, "Well, so you." You have a bullshit job, sir. Yes. It's oh, in, and who are you? I'm. I'm. I'm uh, well, I'm, I, I you don't have to tell us who no, you are. I, Let's I, keep it I, anonymous. I won't tell me my name, but I work in finance. Oh, I'm quite, okay. I'm, I'm quite interested in your point of view. I really like my job. And my clients like what I offered them, and things go well, etc. But the added value of what I do is equivalent to someone going to a casino, basically. At the end of the day, there's no added value. We don't raise capital or help companies do anything. We make. People have money, make more money or lose a bit of money. It's just mm. the equivalent of playing a slot machine, but then high finance, tailor-made derivatives. And how stuff. happy are you in your bullshit job? I, I enjoy going to work every day, every morning. I come home, I enjoy myself at work, I enjoy my colleagues, international. You have fun together. Yeah, everybody speaks three, four languages. Super Pays smart the bills. Guys. They pay the bills really well, etc. So I can't complain about that, but... When I hear that one of my interns, uh, after six months, left, start up his own firm, works with artificial artificial intelligence to um, disrupt the uh, young, uh, uh, recruitment industry, for example, then I think maybe all our intelligence, etc., <laughs> and our uh, university experience could be. You feel it? like being disruptive is so much more useful. Yeah, or just being creative, or have a social okay. impact. Whereas, for, so it's not that I uh, I dislike my job. Okay. Or it's not, a, but it's not a necessary job, basically. Yeah. David, can you be happy? Uh, thank you so much. Can you have a big applause, please, for this guy? Can you be happy? Can you be happy in a bullshit job? It is possible, but it's not common. Um, actually, <laughs> I think according to the statistics from here, um, from the Netherlands, about 6% of people said they both had pointless jobs and enjoyed them. A uh, much larger number were unhappy. I think that there's various reasons that could be the case. And a few people did write to me and said, yeah. I have a bullshit job. It's great. Um, three, only <laughs> three or four, but the, the thing they all had, one was a substitute teacher, one was a French tax official, one was, um, and, and the thing they all had in common was A, they knew what they were getting into. Yeah. You know, they were under no illusions that this was going to be something it wasn't. Um, two, they liked their coworkers, and three, they didn't have anybody supervising them. Okay, so yeah. it made them an autonomous. <laughs> yes. Um, I, when you think I'm checking my email, I'm not. I'm checking whatever you're posting. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a... Um, wait, wait a minute. We have a last one here. Let's move to the next slide, mm -hmm. Merlijn. Um, ah. So those... This is actually of you, very those, This is actually only for those 15 people. Or maybe some of you were in doubt. No, no, I think... Yeah, they can all answer it. Yeah. This is actually interesting because... How bullshit you know, is your how, job? How bullshit does a job have to be before you say it's a bullshit oh. job? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. Let's, There's a lot of people sure say my job is 52% bullshit, but the 48% I do is really important. You know, yeah. Like a nurse. Nurses spend half their time doing paperwork. Yeah, and the other yeah, half is The other very... half is really important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what would you expect? <laughs> well... We're ending up here at a 4.3. So everybody knows mm. a bit what you're talking about. And we all yeah. run into it occasionally. There was a survey done of American office workers. And it said that the average uh, office worker spends at 3.7 hours out of their eight-hour day actually doing something yeah. useful. Okay. And the rest is just wasted effort. Yeah. So then it's you meetings, get more or emails, or paperwork. Kind of yeah. This, okay. Okay. Good. Thanks so much. Um, let, let me put forward another one that uh, has the most votes from the audience. So who put this one in? I so hope people are thinking them. yes. Ah, here in the front. 
Is the Hello. 12 saying, yes, name? that's a good question, or yeah. there, are they saying, yes, it will? It's artificial <laughs> intelligence. Can, can we have your name, please? Yes, my name is Darminda. Darminda, you have 13 votes, so everybody really likes your question. Thank you for that. Can you, will artificial t intelligence kill it? Uh, no. No, artificial mm. intelligence is making it worse in certain sectors, even though it's making it better in others. Uh, basically, uh, digitization, computers, uh, have, ha I would argue, have had opposite effects depending on whether you're dealing with something which is more like manufacturing or something which the other pole would be what I call carrying labor. You know, anything uh, that's in education, health, taking care of or attending to the needs of other people. Now, if you apply AI, computers in general, digitization to, to manufacturing or even sorting fruit, you know, that'll make it much more efficient. More you know, productivity goes up and prices go down, at least in terms of quality. Uh, so you have deflation, technological deflation, they call it. However, if you look at education and health and things like that, actually there's inflation. The reason why is actually digitization AI, is, so far as I can make out, makes it less productive. Um, because, you know, you know, if I'm, if they apply computers to what I do, what that means is I have to spend half my time taking what are basically qualitative human relations and turning them into something that a computer can even understand. And only humans can do that work. And that's work they have to do when they could have been doing their actual jobs. So are, yeah. are you saying that those qualitative human relationships are very important? Yes. To be Nothing can be more important. No. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Th that brings us to the next question, mm -hmm. Merlijn, because aren't we basically talking about what is the value of work here? Yes. Okay, let's see what you guys think when we ask you what is the value of work. If Marlijn manages, yeah, the interaction on that computer is a bit mm -hmm. weird. Can you manage to get it away, the little cross on the top right? Yeah, and then we go to the next one. Ah. What is for you guys the value of work? And I would guess that the, the banker guy would say, well, it's whatever they pay me. Well, no, Coaches. clearly not. Actually, the banker guy said social no, he value. He yeah. said that, yes. Yeah. Um, and people do have a conception of social value, which is different than Don't money. Don't influence them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Caring, yeah. There you yeah. go. I mean, I'm a simple economist. I would say the value is caring. whatever somebody else wants to pay for you. That's what... That's, that's what an economist would say. But it's obviously more meaning, it's getting bigger. Impact. But that means love has no value. Uh, some people pay for it. Yeah, no. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> no but it's obvious. I, sp I, w I was moderating an event last week for right. uh, a group of organizations that work in um, uh, with people who have a very high distance to the labor market, so there's old sociale werkplaatsen, the social working places, and there people are begging to work and to do maybe sometimes even the silliest things, but they really, really want to work. So the value for them yes. of working yeah. is doing something other people are doing, being part of a group, stuff like that. Yeah. How would you define it? Well, this is very interesting because I was just trying to get a sense of what people mean when they say social value. Yeah. Uh, because people would often say that, like, my work, it gives me lots of money, but it has no social value. Well, what is social value? And I think it really caring for other people and taking care of, you know, in a way, all meaningful work is an extension of caring labor. I mean, even if you're making a bridge, you know, you're making a bridge because you care that people can cross the river. Love yeah. is even coming yeah. up. If yeah, you look meaning. behind what is meaning? you, you yeah. can, we can't read the, the tiny letters here, but it oh, says yeah, here stuff to... like... <laughs> Intellectual the stimulation, I don't know social what contact. Appreciation, yeah. sharing, friends, but still money is quite big. Money and, and meaning seem to be, oh, mean, money's yeah, carrying ahead. Is, uh, I mean, they've been neck and neck the whole time. Love is taking yeah. over from meaning. Oh, okay. Well, I see. Oh, you're right. Oh, love has gotten really big, yeah. Um, well, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think but, we can yeah. probably talk the clouds any way we want yes, to. Yes, but, but I think caring love is just kind of the same thing, um, is... is 
In fact, I actually tried, I came up with an idea, I don't have time to develop it now, that instead of production and consumption, we should d substitute caring and freedom. Maybe caring oh, is just... Oh, the hooches are taking over. What, what thing? Hats. Oh. What, what is that? Hats. Something, oh, okay. somebody put a silly word in and okay, it's trying to, to take see. over the whole okay. evening here. <laughs> but just keep saying hooches, right. hooches, hooches. <laughs> I don't know if we should like so we it and enjoy We define them? that as, as silliness. And, silliness, and, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I mean, if you have really have a bullshit job, you will probably spend your day with Exactly, like doing that. that, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, one of the arguments of my book is that if you look at the kind of popular culture you saw in, the, say, the 1960s, you know, it all was stuff that took a lot, you needed a lot of time. You know, like, uh, you know, if you take LSD, it lasts for hours. You know? <laughs> um, you're just out of commission, all this, like, po beat poetry went on and on. You had the 20-minute drum solo. And, and, you know, nowadays it's like cat memes, YouTube rants, it's all these little self-contained things like that. Do you prefer one over the other, LSD I'm or I'm kind of halfway memes? in between myself. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, I actually agree with Brian Eno that the problem with drugs is they last too long. Uh, but um, that's another story. Though the cat, uh, the cat yeah. memes don't seem to go yeah, away. Yeah, that's a little too quick. Um, but, but, I, but I think that most of these popular culture forms you have nowadays are things that you can do while you're pretending to do something else. So these are all things that people do while they're pretending to work. Hmm. Yeah, most social media, Instagram. Yeah. Um, how did we get here? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> we're I mean, talking about the value of work. No, we're talking about it, no, but I mean, yeah. how did we get into to all these oh, oh, into the situation? How, how did humanity yeah. get here? Okay. I mean, we did, we, you did 5,000 years of death. <laughs> how did humanity get into bullshit jobs? And wasn't it always there in some way? Well, sure, there was always pointless jobs. Um, or jobs that we might consider pointless. But you see, the difference between a feudal retainer in the Middle Ages and some guy whose job is to, you know, design the graphics for a corporate report that somebody's never going to look at but just going to slam on the table in a meeting, equally pointless. It's kind of the same thing. But the difference is that people nowadays feel they should be contributing something. Mm -hmm. You know, back. 500, 600 years ago, you know, if I were sitting there fanning the empress, I'd think that was a good job. You know, it's, it's important that someone... Why? Because people thought it was important to do, you know, okay, I mean, but they had different standard of values. Nowadays, people want to contribute something to society and they feel kind of pointless if they I don't. I wonder mm -hmm. if they do, because if we all admit that we once had a bullshit job, yes. but the jobs we have now are not bullshit, Shit, which is or, statistically <laughs> kind of, well, maybe the group is too small. Well, no, so that probably means politics, that huh? we are just doing <laughs> something that is important and, it, and until we've left it behind, we won't admit... No, I think it means was. that nobody wants to get fired and doesn't want to publicly admit that their job is pointless. No, uh, but I they can anonymously <laughs> do it here. No? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that the way we got here is... Actually, I told a story in the book and um, I think what happened is that you know, back in the 19th century, when people thought, said wealth creator, they thought that meant workers. You know, nowadays we yep. think that means capitalists. Back in the 19th century, you know, you read politicians, even I, I was reading the speeches of Abraham Lincoln, and, you know, from, to a modern ear, he sounds like a Marxist. Everybody sounds like a Marxist. You know, they're all saying, all oh, capital is derived from labor, labor is more important. Um, and, and there was this idea that the world is something we produce through work. And, and work was valuable because it's productive. And around the turn of the century, there was a kind of counter offensive. They said, don't get the meaning of your life from your work. You should get the meaning of your life from what you consume at home. You know, you shape your identity through your consumption. And, and it's, you know, us capitalists, we're the people who actually come up with the ideas. You're just like robots working in the factory. That's not important. That's, you know, um, so, so we are the producers of wealth, you know, the rich, rich people, basically. And that's what people seem to think nowadays. It was very, very successful. Um, but I the lost you. The, they changed people's minds about where value comes from. You know, it used to they, be people thought it comes from who, work. Who, who changed them? Well, the pe 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 basically pe industrialists. Uh, if you want to go into history, actually, Andrew Carnegie and a bunch of robber barons actually started this <laughs> idea called the gospel of wealth. And they sent people out to like schools and rotary clubs. And I mean, there's a whole history. Okay, yeah. so we're but, all but I don't brainwashed want to go into, that. into yeah, consumerism. I mean, basically, and yeah, there's consumerism. But 
however it happened, it doesn't matter how it happened. Once you say, you know, you shouldn't get the meaning of your life from what you make or what you do, but rather what you go home and consume, then the question becomes, well, what is the value of work? Why do you want to do work at all? You know, um, other than because you have to. And that's when old religious ideas came back. You know, it was a long-standing idea that labor is sort of, it's suffering, you know? It is our punishment for original sin. We have to work to produce our world. And, and yeah, we we're used supposed to hate to, our work anyway. Yeah, we're supposed to hate our work. Yeah. In fact, it's very interesting that like sociologists who study work, there's like this great paradox because they always discover the same thing, which is one, people get a lot of the meaning of their life from their jobs. And two, most people hate their jobs. You know, how can both these things be true at the same time? And so apparently people get meaning from their jobs because they hate them. You know, their work is like a sign mm. that they're a good person. I am okay. willing to endure suffering, and thus I deserve my consumer toys, you know? And, and, and this seems to be a very deeply embedded idea. But if you think about it, if work is supposed to be this kind of terrible suffering that you endure to deserve the good things in your life, well, anything you get out of your job, anything that makes you happy, that m makes the job easier, more pleasant, is a negative. It's not a positive. And that's why, I mean, I feel that way sometimes. I, I catch myself saying, I really enjoy my job. It's amazing. People pay me for this, you know? Yeah. Why should it be amazing? I mean, I'm doing something useful, right? Because I'm writing the books. fact that people are paying you means it's useful for them or yes, valuable? But, 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 or? but yeah, I mean, I feel that somehow the fact that I'm enjoying it means means like they shouldn't be paying me. Um, and, and people feel that so strongly that they feel that people who get anything out of their jobs, even the knowledge that they're helping other people, shouldn't be paid as much. And you hear people say that. You, say, you hear people say, you shouldn't pay teachers too much because you wouldn't want people who are just interested in money to teach children, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, you know, if, if it's anything you do for altruistic reasons, you shouldn't pay them much. Yeah. So not only is it true that, like, the more useful your work, <laughs> the less they pay you, people think that's right. Let's see what the... Uh, I think that's a lot of how uh, it happened. Audience uh -huh. would want to know from uh -huh. you. I've got a question mm -hmm. with uh, 15 votes. Dana, if you can okay. put uh, the screen back so, on. Yes, I'm And curious. it's this one. What would happen if people would actually work 15 hours a week? Wouldn't they be <laughs> bored or live in some... Who put this question forward? What's your name? Tim. Tim. Yeah. Can I have an applause for Tim? Because nine, 17 <laughs> votes. Yep. Yeah, it's very interesting that, that I often get this question. And there's been a, a series of, of, of even novels about this kind of thing. If you ever read Player Piano by Kurt Vonnegut back in the 50s, what's going to happen when automation comes? The entire working class is just going to be sitting around playing pool and being depressed, you know? Um, I think that's very interesting. I'm an anthropologist, right? And um, as an anthropologist, I know that working an eight-hour day historically is really unusual. It's a lot. I mean, your average oppressed medieval serf on average across the year probably worked four hours you know, uh, a day. And, and you know, m people living in Amazonia uh, probably work two or three. Uh, Somebody's okay. really important. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so, you know, most people have not worked this much. And you know something? They figure out things to do. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, the only reason we can't imagine what we do if we had time on our hands is we don't have enough time on our hands to actually imagine it. But a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people who yeah. don't work really want to work. Sure, and people would work. They just wouldn't, they would do work. They wouldn't that, do that, it 40 hours a week. They wouldn't, yeah. I mean, they and they do it at a normal pace. So, so you know, they'd like work really hard and finish something and then they lie around for a while and that's what normal people do. So maybe yeah. 15 hours is actually a good yeah, combination right. because yeah. you still have colleagues and yeah. you can do the hooches thing You form thing a team and you push yourself into doing some big project <laughs> and then you'd relax and drink and be happy and, okay. and, and you know, and people would have social lives. They'd, they'd all be having all sorts of complicated gossip. If they have friends. Yeah, they they'll have friends. I lived in Madagascar for two years in a village where people worked, you know, they were, they were peasants, so they probably worked on average four hours. Um, you know, in the agricultural season, they worked 12 hours. In the winter, they worked one or two. Um, okay. How about this? Yeah. Capitalism but, is about competition. Why aren't bullshit jobs competed out of the equation? Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, you see, first of all, 
either A, capitalism isn't really about co competition, or B, the system we have now isn't actually capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> and you can take your pick which one you want. It's a game. Uh, Who put it, the question <laughs> forward? What's your name? Job, 20 people, really, so yeah. what, what do well, you... Th <laughs> um, I'd go for the latter, I think... His that name is Job. Job. Bullshit, Job. As in... Uh, Job. Oh, as in like the biblical character or, or having a job? Yeah. Actually, both are appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, but what do you think? So capitalism uh, isn't working, we should make capitalism work better? Well, I think that like we have this idea that capitalism is marked by efficiency. Mm -hmm. And it's not. I mean, um, it's very clear. You know, we think of you know, you think of useless jobs, you think of the Soviet Union, you know, they had a uh, policy of uni everybody should have a job, universal employment, so they had to make up jobs. So, you know, if you wanted to buy a loaf of bread, there are three different people that had to give you a ticket and take the ticket. Yeah. You know, they were constantly making up jobs. Um, why is it capitalism does the same thing? That's a really interesting question. And I think the answer is that the system we have now, in a lot of ways, I've been making all these sort of feudal metaphors. I don't I don't know if they're entirely metaphors. I mean, I think in a lot you of ways... You think we are still in we a are, feudal system? No, we're going back to one. Yeah. Um, I think that, that if you look at where the profits in the city of London and Wall Street, where the profits of the top firms are coming from, it's from finance. You know, even car companies, it's the financial division that actually makes the money now. So finance is about rent extraction. It's about taking, you know, taking money through legal dural means, you know, and and back when I was in college, that was called feudalism. You know, capitalism is when you pay people like and uh, less than you get for selling the product they make. That's capitalism. You know, feudalism is when you just take it, uh, and that's what they're doing now. I mean, I don't know how much the average household in a country like this or a country like America, how you know how much of their income is directly taken away by the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. But I've heard estimates any anywhere between 20 to 40 percent, you know? So, so, so that money is extracted and redistributed. And when you have that kind of system, there's a totally different dynamic than what you have under classic capitalism. You know, we think of capitalism, either if you're a Marxist, if you're a libertarian, you still think of this sort of 19th century version of like medium-sized competitive firms who are making and selling things. That's not what most firms do now. They're mostly bureaucratic, they're tied in different levels of the government, um, and, and they're about extracting rents. And if you're extracting rents, well, actually efficiency is not the most important thing. In fact, I got a lot of testimonies in the book from people who worked for insurance companies, law firms, uh, financial firms, that basically had a big pot of money and had to distribute it to people. Sometimes because there had been a claim settlement or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you know, so here's a billion dollars, you have to give it out to people. And, and they would be intentionally inefficient. You know, they would like, mistrain people, they would put offices in the wrong place, uh, they would lose paperwork systematically because the longer it took them to distribute the money the more the, the more they got to keep them. right so in a way that's the dynamic that's taking over it's not capitalism as we normally imagine it <laughs> um before we go to the question of how do you want to solve it yes. uh, the next one that's the runner-up is this one no, no is I that a so. different <laughs> use of the word bullshit well, I mean, you know, I, I've never understood that. I mean, anthropology <laughs> is about comparing different societies, understanding social possibilities. Uh, why would you not want to know that? Who asked the question? Mm -hmm. Who posted mm -hmm. it forward? Mm -hmm. You want to, uh, do you think anthropology is bullshit? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Oh, then I'm not going over there because I, 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 I mean, was I'm not going to I'm not gonna offer opinions about individual anthropologists. Right? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, but as a discipline, as a whole, the basic as idea an I think is good. <laughs> yeah. You've been traveling around the world, so yes. where mm -hmm. are the most bullshit jobs? Um, and do you also see societies where they manage to kind of deal with it and do really well and have only valuable know. jobs? Someone is. I have not done comparative research on this topic. I definitely got a lot of people from. India, China, Brazil, Egypt, um, you know, so it's not just 
Europe, North America, you know, industrialized rich countries, developing or, or newly emerging market countries, a lot of them have a bullshit job problems too, but I don't know how many. I, I don't no. know, how, I don't have numbers. I okay. don't really know. This research still needs to be done. <laughs> so yeah. you have a lot of years. Beyond. You, you yeah. said in the beginning, that I, I said I'm a freelancer or self-employed, and I, in your book you say then, then I'm, I can't have a bullshit job, or at least I'm not part of the definition Yeah, that well, you I gave. mean, it's a, it's a that? freelance isn't a job. I mean, you know. Uh, what is it? Well, you're, you're, you're doing work. <laughs> but it can also be bullshit. Yeah, you could. I mean, if you're a con man. If you're, yeah. <laughs> but, but but in a way, it's different. Actually, in the beginning of the book, I map that out. You know, you can be so a, a thief or a con man, and you're not actually contributing anything to the world. But it's not really a job. You know, a mafia hitman isn't really a job. Um, you know, bullshit it's job implies working for someone else what and it? like pretending that your job is useful when in fact it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> So that's your yeah. defi definition. Yeah. You yeah. have to work for somebody else. Yeah. I do. So I do. I think artificial consultants maybe count. Yeah. I think artificial <laughs> intelligence will kind of. <laughs> I have to find another job <laughs> because the, the questions are so good. I'll just move on to the ones to the next one here. Uh, we, we've had this one anthropology, um, but how about this one? Um, I think you kind of mentioned it already. Mm. So. It's not the lower pay jobs mostly, it's the... Yeah, I mean, some people are gathering statistics which imply otherwise, but I don't, uh, this is, I don't quite know yet. My impression is that sometimes I distinguish between bullshit jobs and just shit jobs, you know? Like, oh, shit jobs, that's a bad job. Oh, you don't get treated well, you don't get paid much. But those jobs are usually useful you know um if you're digging a ditch you know usually people don't employ people to dig ditches that aren't needed for some reason um you could be you know doing a shit job that's also a bullshit job and that would be really bad you know <laughs> um, that's just like that's as bad as it gets but for the most part um bullshit jobs are pretty well paid and they're pretty nice to have so a lot of people complain about that specifically they say you know i I wanted to do something useful with my life, but I couldn't, you know? I was a preschool teacher, someone told me, and you know, it was great. It was important work to be done, or I was caring for disabled people, and it was great, but I couldn't pay the bills. They just won't pay you enough. I had debts. Um, so finally, I got a job where I'm, you know, highlighting forms for a insurance, medical insurance monitoring corporation, or, you know, something completely useless. And, um, you know, they pay you so much that you can pay your bills and they're hoping eventually they can save enough, they can go back to doing something useful. And maybe they won't. Uh, I feel that mm -hmm. the, the, the questions mm -hmm. are changing to, uh, mm -hmm. we should go to, okay, what should be done then? Basically, okay. you're saying we're, we're, there's too much bullshit around. Mm -hmm. um, some people may not acknowledge it or they may not mm -hmm. admit they're in a bullshit job. And we can have, of course, a big debate on, on the value of, uh, of work and how we all value a difference. But so here's the first question. So what should we do? Should we do something about it? Maybe that's the first, are, are you just showing us this phenomenon or are you saying we should change the way we do it? I'm saying it's a, this is the surest sign we live in a completely stupid and absurd economic system and it's really got to change, yeah. Uh, this is ridiculous. I mean, what could be more dumb than like 40% of the population going to work every day and saying nobody should be doing this? Um, well, they don't get <laughs> angry, so... Well, how do you know? I mean, maybe they I don't know. <laughs> Are they, do they, did they start killing each other? No. I don't think that's a very good criteria for socially you know, acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't caused a zombie apocalypse, it must well, be okay. You've been called, <laughs> you, you have a, you've, maybe if, if it would be 15%, then maybe you would say, let's, send, let's, let's get the psychologists in. Well, if it's 40%, you would expect some kind of well, that's what's revolution or something. I, that's what's fascinating. I mean, why aren't people getting more upset about it? And I think that, that Think about it this way, okay. Um, 
you have all these jobs that people know to be pointless, and then there's the jobs that people don't know that they're pointless because they are in support of pointless work. So say you know, you're the cleaner in a building where they're just doing some tax scam. You, know? you don't know that you're in a bullshit job. So in fact, um, you know, there's useful work being done in support of that. All the people creating the electricity for those buildings or watering the plants or doing pest control. So, so I'd guess at least half the work, and especially if you count the bullshitization of real jobs, more than that, maybe 60% of work can be eliminated. But now you but, are saying what a bullshit job is. Well, wait, wait, I'm just saying, no, I'm saying that if you take what people think is a bullshit job and assume they're right, and then use that to like say that other people are doing real work, I mean, it's not bullshit work to clean, but if you're cleaning a building where everybody else thinks they're doing a bullshit job, I mean, you know, okay. uh, that work could be eliminated. And, and so if, if that were the case, well, think about it. What would happen to global warming if we suddenly reduced all work by 50%? You know? I mean, we'd save the planet. There's, there's a good reason to stop. That's so just one reason. So we have to quit bullshit Think about all the psychological damage. Yeah, well, I think so. And think of all the psychological <laughs> damage, all the depression, all the anxiety. I mean, people report terrible symptoms. I think you'd you know, have a much happier population. You'd have a population that could start doing, think of all the art and culture that people would produce uh, if they actually had some time on their hands. Yeah, but we, we aren't <laughs> sure. You said we need more research or not you, you, in, in the Netherlands we had uh, Fabian Decker who responded to your research eh? he said mm -hmm. it's not 40 percent it's more it's closer to five percent of well people he said who have nine actually but oh, nine. Uh, yeah. okay but but uh, yeah he changed the question like but you know so there's two polls and two, two are the same but and I mean totally those different. are big yeah. claims Let's, yeah. uh, people will be less depressed um, I think uh, we will we will save climate change well I think that 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 even if there's any possibility of this it definitely needs Let's Try. Even if we're just 10 percent, <laughs> like he says, you know, that would make a big difference, you know, in terms of uh, of general health and okay. well-being. So what should yeah. be done? Okay, um, I think there's a lot of things that could be done, but I think that first of all, the key thing is to come up with a solution that doesn't make the problem worse. This is the problem of bureaucracy, because basically a lot of these are useless bureaucratic jobs, right? Uh, the, the classic problem of bureaucracy is what do we do about the fact that we have too many committees? Well, let's create a committee to look into the problem of too many committees, right? Um, so how do you not do that? Uh, how do you address bullshit jobs without creating more bullshit jobs uh, to investigate the problem of bullshit jobs? And this is what I've been trying to figure out. I think there's two approaches that might work. One is to massively reduce working hours. Um, the question By is, law. yeah, that's the problem. I'm a little, I'm a little worried about that for that reason. How to do that in a way that won't create a larger bureaucracy to enforce it, or and, a revolution? Well, a revolution would be nice, <laughs> in my opinion. I'm an anarchist. I think, I think there should be a revolution, but. Um, <laughs> And so the question is yeah. really how to create this I mean, revolution. You know, I know people in um, the Labour Party in the UK who are talking about a four-hour day now. I mean, a, I'm sorry, a four-hour, four-day week. Four-day yeah. week. Four-day yeah. week. A four-hour day would be harder. But uh, see, the problem with a four-hour day is how do you enforce it? Because so many people now are working casualized hours or they're contractors. In the Netherlands, yeah. we are actually the, yeah. the, 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 the kings of um, four-hour, four-day work weeks. And we work a lot of... Uh, part-time uh, so so yeah. you would expect it would go down yeah you see that's why I'm a little suspicious of the the reduction of working hours the argument would be that if companies have to hire more people to replace the ones they let go they'll keep the useful ones and get rid of the useless ones I don't know if that's really the case no, but, but, but then <laughs> um, you only want to get yeah. rid of the bullshit jobs and yeah. now you're reducing the amount of hours but that will well the idea is if they have if, if companies have to redistribute the hours they'll look at what's useful and not. That's, that's the assumption. I don't know if it's true. Uh, I'm, just, it I'm just outlining. Uh, I, it's not my preferred solution. I'm just explaining. What's your preferred uh, solution? I, I, I believe in basic income. Yeah, because I'm a revolutionary. I just think we need to separate work and livelihood. I think that everyone should receive a livelihood. Uh, everyone should be guaranteed the basic means for a minimally comfortable life. And after that, it's up to you. Because let's face it, the only reason anybody's sitting there in a job where they're not doing anything all day long, you know, just like taking one phone call a day and pretending to work, the only reason people are doing that is because they need the money to pay the but rent. But the basic income... <laughs> no one's like, going to take those jobs if but, they have a basic income. But you had the, yeah. the example 
example of the teacher, okay. see, eh, the primary school teacher, yes. and she really loved her job, and she left it because she wanted more money. No, she, you couldn't, she didn't have enough money to pay the rent. Okay. A basic income would have to be enough money to pay the rent. So it would yeah. be higher than yeah. a Yeah, it would have wage. to be enough to live on, yeah. Okay. Right. And with a basic income, you don't, you don't mm. think that people will still do bullshit jobs because then no. they have more money than just to pay the rent? No, because, because nobody wants to do these things. I mean, people say, you know, I want to do something useful, but they won't pay anything to do it. Okay. Uh, so I think people will do things use that are useful, you know, and if they don't pay them that much, it's okay, because it'll be on top of, you know, the money they already have. Yeah, there's so. so much research you can do, because we have mm. all these pilots now with mm. basic income, and you can yeah. go and find out if there's less bullshit jobs there. Um, I would be very interesting. Unfortunately, a lot of the pilots are very limited. Yeah. Uh, but but the, the ones I've seen from India and and I think it was um, Namibia are quite promising. Yeah. Um, I think that there's left wing and right wing versions of basic income, and I should emphasize that everything depends on whether it is used to expand or to contract what I call the zone of unconditionality. So, you know, the right wing version is let's give them money and then get rid of free health care. Now, I, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying we need to expand the zone of what, what you get unconditionally just because you're alive, you know. Um, expand it from things like education and health, which you should still have, to things like the means to pay your rent and eat. Um, but I think that it's very important that it be universal, that there's a principle that, you know, but everybody. You really need a big yeah. revolution then. You want a universal basic income. Well, I mean, if you think about it, even a lot of capitalists are starting to think about it because they realize that there's a problem. You know, if, if they have automation to the point where they don't have any workers anymore, well, who's going to buy their stuff? And who's going <laughs> to pay the basic income? Well, you know, I mean, then we get to my other book about money, right? Oh, okay. uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, but basically leave. money but, is not something that, you know, like is in a limited supply unless you want it to be. Money is created by banks by making loans, right? So uh, yeah. we can be happy that he's still working then. Yeah, we can just make <laughs> up money. Money is easy. Money is a bunch of promises we make to each other. We can make up as much as we like. Okay, I'm taking one more for the, <laughs> from the audience. Who uh, put this one forward? What's the engine behind bullshit jobs? What is the engine behind bullshit jobs? What's your name? Joris. Well done, Joris. Yeah. 11 votes. Okay. Um, very nice. Um, the, I think that there is more than one. I think that part of it is the internal dynamics of corporations. The creation of finance capitalism leads to a phenomenon that I refer to as managerial feudalism. That managers, you know, in, in corporations called empire building, you know, are trying to assemble like the biggest crowd of supporters and, and flunkies. Uh, and, and this is often their, not just their prestige, but sometimes even their salaries are based on how many people they have working under them. Uh, I, there's a guy wrote to me who's an efficiency expert for a bank. And he says he realized he had a bullshit job because for 15 years he's been writing plans on how they can make the bank more efficient. And every time they say, you know, there hasn't been a single time they actually adopted any of his proposals. <laughs> oh my God. So he's a box ticker. He's, uh, you know, um, and and the, what's the reason? Every time it would involve somebody losing power because they wouldn't have as many employees. Um, so 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 that's one engine. But I think there's a political element too. Think about it. Um, the one thing that the left and the right both agree on is that more jobs is good. You know, I, they don't agree on much else, but, you know, you go to a rally, they'll be saying, jobs, you know, jobs, 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 money for jobs, not for war, money for this, jobs, not for whatever it is we're protesting. But it's always jobs, jobs, money for jobs. And, and you know, the left wing version of how to create jobs is you give money to consumers and they'll buy stuff and that'll stimulate production. And then, you know, factory owners will hire people and merchants will hire people to, to sell people things. OK, the right wing version of supply side, they say, no, rich people are job creators. Just give them money and they will hire people. But if you think about it. OK, you just give pe rich people a lot of money and say, you are job creators, go and create jobs. Well, they're not going to hire factory uh, workers or, or people to sell stuff if there's nobody to buy the stuff. So what are they going to do? 
Well, they feel they have to create jobs or most likely thing they'll just create a lot of meaningless flunkies to make them feel good about themselves and that is indeed what happens yeah. this is uh, <laughs> maybe related to this one do you think because it somehow also sounds like you're you really want us to work less yeah um, um, <laughs> not to, just to get rid of the bullshit but in the end now there there's the choice for a lot of people be between being unemployed and having a bullshit job I think it depends on the conditions. I think people who are unemployed in the sense of looking for jobs and unable to find one and uh, don't have the means to do anything else of their time tend to be profoundly unhappy. But it's also the case that um, people in bullshit jobs are profoundly unhappy. Uh, I think that we have made unemployment into a miserable phenomenon. And then we're back to basic income. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if people could relax, if people weren't under pressure to prove they're looking for work all the time, they could actually find useful things to do, you know? I, yeah. And feel more... Um, yeah, and feel a lot of, happier. Part of the society. One of the arguments against basic income, you know, one of the arguments is that give people money, they won't do anything. I just don't think that's true. I think it's... If, if, if people just wanted something for nothing, all those people in bullshit jobs wouldn't be unhappy, right? Um, but on the other hand, um, the other argument is that, well, people would do something, but it, it would be something dumb. You know, a lot of them will be doing things that are useless. So, so the idea is like, if you just give people money and say, go decide what you have to contribute to the world, well, lots of them are going to become annoying street musicians, or they're going to become like crank scientists or bad poets, or you know, so so they'll something have, that maybe will fail you to them, but, but not, not to, to anybody else. People. Nobody will want to pay for. I them. have two responses to that. Uh, one is that if 40% of people already think they're doing useless work, what's the chance that 40% of all people would choose something like that. And second of all, you know, even the ones who are doing that will be a hell of a lot happier uh, than they yeah. are doing, you know, filling out forms all day. And number three, all you need is just like one of those bad musicians to be, you know, Miles Davis or John Lennon or something, or one of those scientists to be Einstein. We will end up with more brilliant yeah, people. Yeah, and, 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 and the world will be better off. You'll have made but, your um, investment. Uh, I think we can uh, <laughs> uh, take Menti away and go back to the, the, the other, the photo slide. Um, so to, to kind of wrap it all up, what, if people read your book, which I hardly have to do anymore, I think. Oh, no, there's this. lots of stuff in it I haven't told you about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> By the book. What are you hoping? Lots of copies. Uh, lots of? <laughs> lots of copies. Lots yeah. of copies. And it's, you it's will small be... enough to give to your friends and large enough to throw at your Yeah, enemies. and you'll yeah. be signing <laughs> so, uh, after this in about uh, five minutes. Okay, yeah. But what are you hoping five, five will happen to people <laughs> once they've read it? What, what, what will do? Will they acknowledge how bullshit their own job is, or will they, what will, what will, how will they change the world from that moment? Well, I think it's important to understand the world you live in. And this is something that a lot of people recognize intuitively, but they realize they, you're almost taught not to see it. It's right in front of your eyes. So in a certain way, I'm just giving people an excuse to like be able to talk about something they, they kind of already know. But somehow you're not supposed to say. So, so I think that's one thing. That, you know, so you could just leave the book on your desk um, to you know, start a conversation or give it to a friend as a way of dropping a hint. You know. And um, you know, so it can, it can cause conversations that, that need to happen. The old fashioned hand up. Here. Yes. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Rio. <clears throat> Two short questions. Okay. What will happen with the questions? <laughs> we will, uh, You're asking yes, me? You <laughs> yeah. And uh, the other question is, uh, what would you have written if the article did not go viral? Uh, what, what else did you have? After that, oh. you were, you know, and then this came, like, up. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the book that I am writing next. You want to hear about that? Yeah. Okay. I'm working with an archaeologist, <laughs> and we've been working for five years on a book about... Well, it started as a book on the origins of social inequality, uh, but it has evolved into a book about why the entire question of the origins of social inequality is kind of a dumb question. I basically, we have this story in our heads that 
you know, once upon a time, there were these little happy bands of hunter-gatherers, and they were egalitarian, but they were small. You know, when things get big, you have to let, you can't do that anymore. So first they invent agriculture, so you get private property, and then you get cities, and with cities come the state, and bureaucracies, and wars, and all this bad stuff, right? So that's the story that we all know, right? But it also means high culture and writing, and you know, so civilization, love it or leave it, that's the story. Every single element in that story is factually wrong. That is not actually what happened at all. Uh, Hunter-gatherers, even in the Ice Age, could be very hierarchical, but usually only in one time of year. So people would go back and forth between you get equality and, and hierarchy sometime, you know, over the course of a year. Uh, agriculture was a sort of feminist reaction against slaveholding. It wasn't what we think at all. Um, early cities oh are often <laughs> extremely egalitarian. There's no signs of hierarchies. Um, and, and so, so you know, what, it's, what we thought happened isn't what happened. We just have to start over again and write an entirely different story. So I'm working on that. So, <laughs> next year here. Uh, we've done the questions with Probably the most votes, but a, a lot of people uh, still are putting up their hands. So maybe you put one in, but didn't get enough votes, and then why not try? <laughs> Hi, I'm Alice. Um, actually, you kind of started to touch on it there, but my point is I'm also a believer in UBI, but I think that... Um, what do you mean UBI? Universal, Universal basic, basic income. income. Okay. <laughs> but the fact is that that's never going to pay people anywhere near as much as corporate lawyer or most of those tick box jobs that you mentioned but I think the flip side of all of those overpaid jobs and maybe it doesn't matter in a way that they exist is that we can't find a way or that they are the other side of an economic system which doesn't value teaching caring um, you know healing people who are sick and how could we actually design a system which could do that at the other end isn't that the bigger problem than the yeah. existence of the jobs uh, I would say yes, yeah. I, I agree with you very strongly on that. I think that universal basic income is a policy, but what we need is a fundamental moral and conceptual revolution about what is the value of work. And we need to move away from the notion of production, which is very patriarchal, you know, and, and, and back to a notion of caring labor as the fundamental, fundamental form of value creation. I mean, you know, most work isn't about producing anything. Most work is about maintaining and taking care of things. I mean, I always say, you know, you make a cup once, but you wash it a thousand times. Uh, work is about maintaining things, keeping things nice, keeping them the same, taking care of animals, plants, people, things, buildings. You know, and, and, and that's what people actually do. They take care of each other and the, their environment. And, and I think if we start from that and come up with an eye conception of value, that that is the primary form of value, then, then that would be a society that would make sense. And the more we have computers taking care of actual production, the more it makes sense to, that's where value comes from. Because it's not just that it's not just that AI and, 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 and robots and computers can do production better. It's also, I mean, probably they can do caring labor, but you don't want them to do that. You know, this is the kind of labor that you want people to be doing, and you want to be, do, you want to be freed up from drudgery so that we can take care of each other. And that's the kind of society we want. But the question is, it's very difficult politically. I actually coined the phrase the revolt of the caring classes uh, as, as what we need. But in a way, it's starting to happen. I, I feel that Occupy was, in a way, the first kind of stirrings of this revolt. If you look at the people, especially the people who kind of couldn't come to the occupations but expressed their support on the We Are the 99% Tumblr page, overwhelming majority were in what I would call the caring professions. They were in health, education, social services, and they all said the same thing. I wanted to have a job where I could benefit other people. Well, at least I wasn't hurting them, you know? And, and if you want to do something where you care for others, they'll give you, they'll put you so deeply in debt and they'll give you so little money that you can't even take care of your own family, your own children. This is ridiculous. And, and that was the sort of, that was the, the, the real cry of, of outrage that drove the movement. And if you look at like, 
strike movements, you know, around the world. Um, but are you yeah. saying this is still happening? Yes, it is. We have it is happening. I mean, look, look, look at who's on strike. Um, in, in England, there was professors and junior doctors. In America, you have teacher strikes all over yeah. the place. And in France, I was in France, they said uh, care home workers Nurses. went on strike for the first time in French yeah. history. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So the next book, when? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. I have to write it. I'm working on it now. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be seeing you back here in, what, maybe a year? Uh, two. Two. One okay. Two. No. Let's uh, make an agreement on that. Can okay. I have a big round of applause, please? David Greber. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm guessing um, that you'll be running off to the table where we can uh, oh, yeah, buy I the book to. and you'll sign mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And then after mm -hmm. that, straight on to the bar, I hope. Okay. Hope to see you there. Thank you so much.